May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. It is my great honor to have been asked to take part in the liturgy this evening, Wednesday in Holy Week. The liturgy animated by arguably one of the most challenging gospel stories we read together outside of the passion narrative of Good Friday. Because if my own relatively short experience with this sort of thing has taught me anything, it is that so often the worst parts of pain are in seeing it coming, just imminent enough for us to fear it, but not yet close enough to know how deeply it might hurt us. And if there's a catalog of things in a human life that cause us pain, I am sure that betrayal has a prominent position in it. The annihilating thing about betrayal is not the moment of the act itself. It's not the slander spoken or the object stolen. Things like slander and robbery and violence are sins themselves. But to betray someone this acts within a deeper layer of tragedy, a layer wherein there is not just an injury, but a destruction of a prior love. In order to betray, there must be a relationship. There has to be this agreement, some deliberate mutuality, something that has been created and is now severed. Whatever the motivation might be, betrayal means that there was something at some point that became more important than whatever love had been there before. I have a very difficult time imagining that something as complicated and painful as this, this worst part of human experience, was necessary for our salvation. Throughout Holy Week, I find myself wanting to accuse God. If you are God, really, could you have not done anything, literally anything at all, to redeem us? You who created the cosmos with a word. You who luxuriated in the breadth of your heart and said, light. And there it was. Earth. And there was earth. Love in my own image. And there was, of all things, a person. So what is this? It seems so obvious. All you have to do is say it. If you are really the God that everyone says that you are, are not even the words on your breath enough to fall into the dirt and redeem it? How is it possible that the pain of betrayal is necessary to salvation? In my house this week, one night at dinner was spent looking up this story from our reading from John this evening in each one of the four Gospels. I needed to see and hear and read how this cataclysmic breach of trust was remembered in Scripture. And as I read through it, I was surprised, more like shocked, really, to read how starkly the words, Satan entered into him, stood out from the rest of the story how these words were positioned with just, within just the story of a supper. It's already not an easy story to read. Jesus is troubled and his betrayal is foretold and the disciples naturally start getting very nervous. Who is it who will do this? And so Jesus dips the morsel into the cup and he hands it to Judith, Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, this same act whose basic composition defines the sacrament of the Eucharist we celebrate here in this church every day. A giving of bread, and what we've come to know with one another as a giving of life, here handed over like a sentence of death. The New American translation of the Bible reads, after he took the morsel, Satan entered him. Does evil come because Judas took the bread? Was Satan already there? How could such evil be nestled so closely around a holy table 
and noted so intimately in scripture near these other stories of Christ's servanthood and teaching. Around my kitchen table, cluttered with books and dishes and Bibles and cats, even the word Satan felt out of place. And yet as much as I wanted it to be strange and difficult to sit with the idea of evil so closely knit into the same tapestry as the good, it seems that this dissonance is perfect for telling the story of our own journey through Holy Week. This is a week where the breadth of God's love and the depth of human suffering are remembered side by side. In the shadow of God's glory, the tsunami of human deprivation crashes onto each of our own personal beaches and hauls us out to sea. We read about the continual coming of Christ in the Eucharist and the new commandments to love God and one another, and the promise of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the kingdom, and all of this is placed against the agony of waiting for death in the Garden of Gethsemane and the crucifixion that comes so quickly. There is good right alongside evil, generosity right alongside betrayal, and love right alongside shame. The Gospel writers do not separate them, and the story of salvation appears to require all of it. I would love to stand here and say how timely, how good of us to think about this at this time in history with these difficulties, with these news stories. But really, has there ever been a time in history when we did not need to be reminded of this? I can't help but think that the love of Christ that is revealed in the resurrection story comes to us through such hardship because we need it then as we need now to really, actually know that there is no match for it. For I am persuaded, St. Paul wrote to the Romans, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Through his betrayal and passion, death and resurrection, Jesus collapsed the spaces between our lives and God that we so preciously fill with doubt and despair. And through this assures us there is nowhere I have not been. There is nothing I have not known. A few years ago, I was working chaplaincy at a prison for incarcerated women. There were women of all ages there, and races and religions and stories and reasons for being there and reasons they were really hoping to leave. And it was actually during Holy Week, I led a small workshop on the Stations of the Cross. We discussed the history of Christians making pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the significance of churches and towns and religious orders and even people in their own homes who created their own versions of the events of Christ's journey to the cross. Even in the small chapel there in the prison, there weren't stations like we see here in churches like these. But near the end of the class, a group of women were insistent that we go ahead and make our own. And so on, of all days, Holy Wednesday of that year, 40 or so incarcerated women, two chaplains, and three prison guards worked together to create a way of the cross around the inside of the central mess hall. We did not have icons. We didn't really have anything, to be honest. But for each station, a small group created something that for them represented it. We wrote prayers and took turns adding photos and drawings to the wall and assigned readers and acolytes just like we do in church. The first station. Jesus is condemned to death. On the wall was a calendar with a big black X marked for every day that had spent inside. It belonged to a woman who was serving her sentence for life. The 
Fourth station. Jesus meets his afflicted mother. The whole wall near a door was covered in photos of children. Children with their mothers now inside. Children at soccer games and in school plays, running through playgrounds. Children whose absence bled like wounds through the hearts of women who, like Mary, loved them and suddenly could not touch them. The sixth station. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. I was confused at first, at this spot on the wall, because there were no photos and there were no drawings, just a small square of thin, dirty paper taped to the side of some painted cement. I asked the woman who was in charge of that particular spot what the paper meant. Veronica loved Jesus, right? She asked. Yeah, I said. She wanted to comfort him before he got killed, right? Yeah, I, I think she did, I replied. Well, the night before I had to come here, the woman told me, my sister made me dinner. And afterward, homegirl rolled me a smoke. She used another word for smoke. But I'm not ordained, and I'm not going to try to say it in the pulpit. But seeing what that had meant to her, nothing less than wiping the face of Jesus with a small piece of paper and a gesture of love extended in sympathy and courage. The tenth station. Jesus is stripped of his garments. There was a prison issue bra taped up to the wall surrounded by photos from weddings. The fourteenth station. Jesus is laid in the tomb. A copy of the prison Bible study schedule. I asked about this one, too. People think we're dead, one woman told me. But here, we're going to live again. Again and again, we heard Christ. There is nowhere I have not been. There is nothing I have not known. As Jesus made clear that the project of his betrayal and crucifixion was reconciliation of humanity to God, he forever destroyed any separation we might have longed to keep between ourselves and the other. Any division between those we call good and those we call degraded, the ones we see as holy and the ones we dismiss as ignorant, the imprisoned and the free, is made whole in the body of Christ. Through Holy Week, any pretense of difference is bound up in a crown of thorns. It is rinsed in blood and water flowing from ribs. It is redeemed in the repentance of a thief taken down from the cross, buried in linen, and returned to us, walking upright along the path from Hades to salvation. Because to live the gospel is to live a life where we are asked to hold both the very best and the very worst of humanity at the same time and still persist in embracing grace. At times, there is the pitched joy of the resurrection. Even the humblest glimpse of it is electrifying when we have allowed ourselves to finally be opened to what it means. But we are also, I think at times, especially this week, meant to be brokenhearted. We are meant to recognize tragedy when we feel it and when we see it and when we make it happen. We are meant to never forget the planks in the eyes of our own souls because these are our vital signs. They orient us toward an openness to rewriting tomorrow and the tomorrows after that with a grammar that draws us steadily closer into the heart of God. If we were Christ, each of us, in a perfect heaven, we would not need them. 
but our blessing in this ache of Holy Week is that the distance between our sin and God gives us a place to enter fully through Christ into grace that anoints us with nothing less than Easter joy. This is hard. It's hard to think about. It's hard to preach about. It's hard to pray about. To be one standing before this grace and depth of spirit is to be as one trying to stand beneath an ocean, thundering over the edge of the earth and trying to fill a teacup. How could we possibly bear it? Thankfully, the gift of these liturgies that we begin tomorrow evening with Maundy Thursday and continue through Easter are like divine hands that reach into the water for us. And they cup a small, good portion of it just for us to see and touch and drink. We, by ourselves, will never know the mind of God or fit our own logic into some algorithm of salvation. But we know how to sit alongside one another. And we know how to ask for mercy. We know how to say thank you. And we know how to make our hearts into places of refuge for one another. We are bound up with one another in assurance that even though we might not yet know how deeply we can be hurt, we are assured that nothing will separate us from this love of Christ who inhabits even tragedy and even betrayal. If the incarnation we celebrate with Advent and Christmas is God sending Christ forth toward the yearning arms of humanity, Holy Week is surely nothing less than Christ bringing humanity forth into the yearning arms of God. Let us meet him there. Amen.